Welcome. I'm Nicole Owings Bonner, and I work in the Practice Directorate at APA, and I'll be moderating our webinar on HMB codes today. This webinar is being recorded, and a copy will be emailed within 24 to 48 hours to all participants, including those who registered but could not join the live presentation. A PDF copy of the webinar slides are available for download in the handout section above the chat box on the right side of your screen. There will be an opportunity for a Q&A with our presenter during this webinar. Please use your chat box on the screen to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Many thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We received over 100 questions. Many of these questions were similar, and we will try to address as many as possible, as well as those that are submitted during the webinar. Now I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Antonio Puente, 2017 President of APA, who has worked on reimbursement codes for more than 25 years. Welcome, Dr. Puente. Good day. Thank you for having uh, th this particular webinar and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be with all of you. Look forward to your questions uh, after this uh, 30 to 40 minute presentation. All right, so the presentation outline is right before you and there's a little bit of history and then we get down to the really nitty gritty and that's the guidelines of the specific health and behavior codes which uh, we'll be referring to from this point forward as the HMB codes. Documentation, critical issues, especially when it comes to auditing and payment, and finally uh, some case examples will be provided. Look forward to the webinar and look forward to your questions. Okay, let's go on with slide number three. I wish I could tell you that there is uh, really a pretty straightforward and easy history to all of this and uh, there was a, a simple way to explain the origins of the H&B codes, but it's not that straightforward. Let's start with the physician definition. According to uh, the federal guidelines, specifically CMS and Medicare, there are 13 uh, different healthcare providers of which 12 of those are considered physicians. Uh, these individuals have access to what we call the evaluation and management codes and also access to, if you will, 52% of the cognitive part of the reimbursement dollar, which is only ascribed to physicians who think we have historically been known as technicians. This goes back to our inability to basically get everything together when the Medicare program started back in the mid-1960s, and then subsequently our misinterpretation of what a physician was uh, when the Social Security Act of 1989 occurred. So in essence, the bottom line is that we do not have uh, access to what we call evaluation and management codes. What does that mean? Essentially, there are two kinds of codes, or if you will, activities that can be done. Of the 9,000 or approximately 9,000 procedures that the federal government, the American Medical Association, and of course CMS slash Medicare, Medicaid uh, allow, uh, we are limited to essentially doing what we call procedure codes, specific activities, and namely there are two that we do. We do primarily diagnostic work such as interviewing and testing, or we do intervention work, such as, for example, psychotherapy. What's really left is the, the difficulty in what we call follow-up. How do we deal with patients that we just want to catch up on, if you will, from time to time? Also, there is a big problem. And that problem is that despite the fact that we did not have access and we have had uh, no access to e &M codes, the difficulty uh, facing psychologists is that we're really circumscribed only to dealing with mental health problems. Well, we all know there's much more to psychology than just dealing with mental health problems. And this is basically our avenue to address this point. When I was part of the CPT uh, workforce to develop what we currently call the fifth edition, uh, which is what we're working under, uh, they asked, what is it that psychology needed? And for me, without a doubt, was access to evaluation and management codes. Well, in not having those, this is really what came out. 
let's tell you the story and also get into the specifics of the codes. Next slide, please. So this is probably the central point of today's presentation. The health and behavior codes are limited to a physical health diagnosis, not applicable to psychiatric illnesses. However, you could treat them both. For example, you could have someone who's diabetic and depressed, but not necessarily dealing with the mental health issues. So as we'll talk about uh, during our presentation today, the physical health diagnosis, whether it's acute or chronic, is focused essentially on the ICD, International Classification of Diseases, the 10th edition, which is what we're currently using, and we have for a couple of years. But also, it's imperative to know that out of the approximately 69,000 different diagnoses, we are basically circumscribed to what historically has been called the F codes or Chapter 5 codes. Well, what about the other 20-some chapters that deal with musculoskeletal disorders, neurological problems, uh, issues having to do with obesity and weight management? Well, these are those codes. We're not talking about DSM. We're talking about ICD. Next slide, please. As we have said several times before, these uh, services are different than what we might call the psychotherapy codes, but let's talk about it in more generic terms. These codes are intended, these procedure codes are intended to be used for physical disorders and not mental health disorders. And they are, as you can see, really robust in the sense that you can work on, for example, adherence, symptom management, health and promotion of behaviors, health risk taking, and for that matter, health uh, reducing uh, situations that could be problematic, and overall adjustments to physical illness. Now, it could very well be, as we've stated before, that we have both a physical diagnosis and a mental health diagnosis. There's no reason why you cannot include them both in your report as we'll talk about later on. But in this case, when you're dealing with health and behavior codes, the primary diagnosis, the diagnosis on record, the issue that you're dealing with is a physical health problem. So you might end up putting, for example, depression or a conduct disorder, but when it's all said and done, they fall after the primary diagnosis, which in this case is basically a physical diagnosis. Next slide, please. How are they established? Well, I told you a little bit about the history. And uh, of course, it's complicated, related to our limitations to not being physicians, not having access to any and codes, and the importance of the CPT system wanting to work with us and giving us access to opportunities that heretofore we haven't had. Again, to summarize, how do we do follow up on patients? But how do we deal with people that? for all practical purposes, do not have as a primary focus for our, our, our situation uh, a what we call an, uh, a DSM diagnosis. So to make this happen, even though our discussions with CMS and CPT started back uh, in the uh, 1990s, it wasn't until the combined efforts of the APA's practice directorate and the Interdivisional Healthcare Committee, often referred to as the IHC, uh, under the supervision and direction of our very, very competent and uh, longtime representative of uh, healthcare economics, Randy Phelps, Dr. Randy Phelps, uh, that put together a group with divisions uh, 17, counseling 22, uh, rehab 38, health. Uh, 40 and, and of, of course 54, that they all came together and said, hey, we need something that allows us to engage our scope of practice, our training to reduce the physical health problems of our patients. 
And that is really how the H and B codes came to be. So kudos to Randy and all those that served on the IHC during that time, because you set the foundation to open up avenues for psychology that we have only imagined and, and dreamed of for many years. So let's see how we can make those dreams become a reality. Next slide, please. Well, there are two sides of this coin that we are now working with. There is the assessment side, and as you'll see in a few moments, there is the intervention side. So despite the fact that I've mentioned to you that these codes were really meant to follow patients, especially uh, in circumstances involving uh, physical diagnosis, we have for the purposes of making uh, our life operational, divided them into two parts. First part is assessment, which we'll tackle for the next few minutes, and then we'll switch our focus to interventions. So in this case, in terms of assessment, we're identifying any number of things, including psychological, behavioral, emotional, cognitive, or social factors. Any one alone is sufficient and all combined are acceptable. It's also in the prevention, treatment, and management of physical health problems. The idea is to focus on biopsychosocial, not mental health factors, even though it's important to know that mental health factors play a role in this situation. And it could very well be that you are going to do both a physical focused situation, such as for example, adherence to medicine, but also you may want to do focus on depression as well. They are compatible and they can be done in the same day, but the focus again is on physical health problems. And one of the things that's so interesting, unlike our other CPT codes that we have, for example, for mental health issues such as intervention or uh, in the case of diagnosis, we have the interview and then we have the testing. This set of codes is very open and very robust and does not limit one to a particular procedural activity. As you can see from the slide, it could be an interview. It could be an observation. It could be psychophysiological monitoring or the, the application of health-oriented questionnaires and, for that matter, tests. So. Unlike our other procedure codes involving diagnosing, these codes involve anything that you do to obtain information to identify psychological, behavioral, emotional, cognitive, and or social factors that impact physical health. Next slide, please. All right. I know we've been at it for 15 minutes. You want the bottom line. Here we are. In terms of the assessment codes, we're going to give you a couple of codes. And the first and by far most critical one is 96150. If you've heard me talk recently, you've heard me talk about the concept of a base code or a fundamental code. The base code is essentially where you start off from. You can build from there, but this is essentially the beginning code. You cannot do an assessment unless you start with 96150. And what is that? Well, the title itself, you see in the first three words, health and behavior assessment, very generic. But notice that we have an EG, EG, not IE. So it could be interview, observation, psychophysiological monitoring, questionnaires, and or tests, or all of those, or any combination thereof. Now, let's get down and dirty with really very specific situations. We're talking about 15 minute increments. So what does that mean? In essence, each 15 minute is basically one unit. So in the insurance form, you have to put down 15 under, or if you will, number of units is equal 15. If you do 30 minutes, it's two. 45 is 3. Also, I know it sounds odd, but let's make it real clear. You must do a minimum 
of seven minutes and 31 seconds. If you don't do that, you don't have uh, the criteria reached or the threshold to build a unit. So think of it as every time that you have a unit, you have seven and a half to 15 minutes and then seven and a half more until, if you will, the next unit is built. This is also a particularly problematic issue. And that is, this has to be face to face. That means talking to nurses, staff, and so forth, so on, whereas extremely useful in these kinds of situations does not apply to billable activity. May be useful, may be necessary, but it's not necessarily billable. I take full credit for this particular problem. When we got these codes several years ago, I was asked the question, I understand that you're now gaining access to roughly 97% of the type of patients involved in healthcare. That's unusual. It's a big move for psychology. I assume, and that's the way the question was asked, that you're only billing face-to-face -face time, essentially how we do in evaluation and management code. Well, with such a loaded question, is such a paradigm shift right on the table, I fail to really think of the long-term implications. So we find ourselves dealing with only face-to-face -face billing. Now, is that acceptable? No. Will that be changed? Hopefully, when we're working on it. And finally, in terms of 96150, we're talking about the initial assessment. This is the base fundamental first step in trying to gather information, which by the way, may not be a bad first step if you're going to do any kind of intervention. Now, having said that, it could very well be that you've done a neuropsych evaluation and that has already captured all the assessment information you need and you want to go intervention. If that's the case, totally fine. You can move on to intervention. However, if not, consider starting here. Now, what happens if you want to go back and do more testing, more observation, more talking to the patient, because there could be a fluctuation in the patient's condition? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. And that next slide tells us, how do we go about doing further testing or further observation? This is what we call reassessment. In essence, again, if you're going back, say, for example, Tuesday, or maybe later in one day, the patient's coming out of a coma. Uh, they have just been injected with um, corticosteroids or some variation of the theme, and you want to come back several times throughout the day to see whether it's been a significant impact. Let's take a look at that patient over and over again. This is what the reassessment codes are all about. So 96150, the initial base code, 96151, the reassessment code. Always face to face with the patient. Next slide, please. All right, now let's talk about intervention. I mentioned to you that there was two sides of this coin. Side one, the head, if you will, was the assessment, the tails. Side two is the intervention. What's this all about? This is about the modification, again, of psychological, behavioral, emotional, cognitive, and or social factors. One, more, doesn't matter. The whole goal is how do you affect the physiological function, disease status, the health and well-being, and improvement, improvement of health using one of these procedures. Now, hold on. Does improvement actually mean getting better? Well, in some cases, getting better is defined as just holding the status quo. For example, in chronic pain, maybe just not making things worse could be one. Or let's say that in the case of dementia, where your goal is to control the slide, allow the dignity component to be part of the DC disease component in, in a way that you're just helping control the slide. So improvement, which essentially means that you have achieved medical necessity by improving the body part, may actually result in overall 
if you will, increase in health functioning or maintaining the health status or slowing the slide that's inevitable with a specific disease process. For example, dementia, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and other deteriorating diseases of uh, the, in this particular case of the nervous system. So let's go on to slide number 11, please. Now the intervention codes, again, and once more, face to face with a client, and each unit could be, uh, or is, I should say, 15 minutes. And un unlike the other uh, intervention, excuse me, uh, I should say assessment codes, what we have here is a variety of intervention codes that is essentially uh, focused on the type of situation that you encounter. For example, if you're working directly with a patient and no one else, that's 96152, individual. If you're working with two or more patients, and usually six to 10 patients at any one point, you use 96153. It's important to note, it's 96153 for each individual patient, not just, if you will, for all patients, for each patient. John Doe, Jane Smith, each one gets 153. Next slide. Now, if you participate with the family, you have 154. And that is with a, pa a patient's family pre present. So you might want to talk to the family about uh, if you uh, consider uh, compliance techniques or explaining the disease uh, condition, how to assist in teaching relaxation techniques and so forth and so on. So uh, this is with a patient present and a family. And family is broadly defined, as you might imagine. It's not necessarily biological or for that matter, legal. Uh, it is now actually in CPT terms often referred to as the informant. In other words, somebody of some significance to the patient that is involved with their health status. Uh, if the family is uh, present without the patient there, then you may want to consider 96155. Now, this is not reimbursed on a regular basis by private carriers, and I believe almost no Medicare carriers. They believe that the patient is not present, then a service is not provided. Uh, we are working to try and explain the complications of that narrow and limited perspective. Sometimes it's in the best interest of the patient, and for that matter, the overall health status for the patient not to be present to address situations such as how do you shape the complex and volatile behavior of a child that's been just diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. So with that, let's go on to the next slide. One of the questions that people often ask is, how often can I do this? Well, we're bound by confidentiality in agreement with CMS and AMA current procedure terminology, not to divulge uh, the limits of these codes or the often uh, used uh, uh, local coverage determination interpretations by the Correct Coding Initiative uh, directed by Dr. Niles Rosen. But we can say the following, that an initial assessment, the original base code that we talked about earlier, it's not atypical to have one to two hours which translates into four to eight units. The reassessment, in other words, coming back later in the day or other days, four to six units. And finally, the group itself, it's eight units. But keep in mind, this is our estimate of what could be shared with you. So it could be more, could be less. And all of this is trumped by uh, the actual local coverage determination. And this is particularly the case when we talk about the total units per day. In other words, one could end up being involved in very intensive uh, care activity and where the, the psychologist is required to be on staff, in, uh, on the floor, much more than the uh, drive-by uh, consults that sometimes we participate in. So in this case, the number of units could go up, but it's critical 
that you understand that these are aspirational, average, and not necessarily what the local coverage determination decision has been made by the carrier that supports the service of that to that particular patient. So it is critical that you consult with your own carrier or carriers to determine how best to proceed. One thing that I often have uh, suggested and might be of value to you is choose the top three or five carriers, get an idea what the limitations that they work with and use that as a foundation for how to proceed with all your patients, realizing that when it's all finished, it's up to what they have told you it's acceptable and what you or your company or institution have signed on as to be the contract for what is considered to be the minimum and maximum total unit. Next slide. I guess the bottom line to a lot of this for many of us is how can I get paid and how am I going to uh, find a, a source of revenue stream. And here we have all the codes in the first column, 150, the initial assessment, 151, all the way to uh, 55 without the patient present. You can see that we're using the single unit of 15 minutes to provide a rough idea, 2268, for example, on 150. And note that the group, for example, chronic pain group, it's 153, it's 468. But we're also assuming that you're talking about six or eight or maybe possibly 10 uh, patients at that time. So the concept is we're talking about a little less than $100 an hour, which in general appears to be a little less than the psychotherapy codes. But in fairness to the process, these codes were, uh, and the numbers associated with them were obtained what seems like eons ago, and the psychotherapy codes, which many of us are comparing ourselves to, are codes that were revitalized, reframed, and essentially revalued less than five years ago. So we look forward as we move into the near future for APAPO, and again, on the direction of Randy Phelps, uh, to make sure that we revisit these codes, make sure that an appropriate reimbursement and issues such as face-to-face -face value are attended to. But for right now, you're talking about a reimbursement rate that's a little bit less on average to approximately 90 or so dollars uh, per hour of providing uh, assessment or intervention services with intervention being slightly less reimbursed than assessment. Uh, let's go into some additional detail. Next slide, please. One of the more important aspects of, of the work that we do these days is making sure that the information that we have uh, documented uh, essentially is uh, useful to those of us uh, that refer our patients or that work with us. Uh, it goes without saying that it would be probably unwise to go and do H and B work without some type of interface with a primary care provider or a specialist. I think it behooves all of us when we work with H and B codes to assume that we have a relationship of some sort with a physical health provider. And we want to share our notes as a way to inform them. I suppose that in this day of electronic communication, it's more typical for most of us not to call, but to write and provide information, whether it's in the EPIC chart or whether it's a, a written note to uh, our colleagues in the physical health world. And you may want to consider the following. Uh, first of all, you may want to put one onset and history of initial diagnosis of the physical illness. And you may not necessarily want to uh, ignore uh, uh, the mental history as well, mental health history. Why are we doing this? Why is the assessment required? This actually speaks more directly to the philosophical foundations of what we call medical necessity. And specifically, how is this activity going to accept or if you will, understand the situation better. And once we have that, then we have at least philosophically captured that you're doing this for the purposes of improving the body part. The outcome should include a mental status and ability to understand and respond meaningfully 
this is going to be a challenge in some patients that don't want to see a psychologist or in other cases that they don't know that the uh, provider that they're seeing is a psychologist or for that matter, what does it mean to be seen by a psychologist? If at all possible, establish measurable goals and expected duration of physical intervention. So once we have a diagnosis of pain or diabetes uh, compliance, then we can say our goal is to reduce the pain from significant to uh, mild. And our goal is also to work with a patient once a day, once a week for a period of four, six, 10 weeks, whatever the case may be, maybe maybe longer if it's a chronic uh, situation. And that provides uh, a, an assessment of how you're doing. And if you're going to be doing this on a regular basis, or I should say on a uh, long-term basis, it might not be a bad idea that you might uh, put down in the assessment, we will reassess, say, in a month or in a quarter or once a year, whatever the case is, Take stock of where you were the last time you made the assessment. Uh, take a look at the progress and uh, document all of this. Uh, if nothing else, this is critical to avoid any penalties, complications uh, from auditing services that essentially would mean that you'd have to pay back or in some cases actually uh, pay a fine. Documentation is the only way to survive an audit. It's not what you think you did. It's not what the patient says. In fact, it doesn't even matter in some ways whether they improved according to these auditors. What matters is what you documented. And these are some of the basic things you may want to pursue in your assessment. Next one, please. Now, what about uh, intervention? Uh, what are we supposed to be documenting there? Uh, first of all, you probably ought to document that the patient understands what's going on and they will respond uh, meaningfully. One of my colleagues once was seeing a patient for psychotherapy in a, in a rehabilitation setting. Uh, well, it doesn't seem plausible that that a capacity to understand has been established. And therefore, if you're audited, that will mean that you have not documented successfully that your intervention is of any value. What is the intervention? Is it relaxation? Is it cognitive behavior intervention? Is it behavioral? Is, is it basically psychoeducational? Whatever it is, make sure that you're clear. And don't just put down psychotherapy. Put down the kind of psychotherapy that you're doing. Don't put down behavioral intervention. Put down you did some reinforcement strategies, punishment, whatever the case is. Make sure it's clear and it's tied to the original goals that we mentioned earlier in the uh, assessment. The measurable goals of the intervention are stated clearly, not only in the long term, but even today. So, for example, I start the uh, intervention and I ask on a one to 10 scale, or better put, in a Liker type scale of one to seven, where are you with one being this and seven being that? So you start and say it's a six, and then at the end of the intervention, you ask again, and they say it's uh, maybe a five. Uh, the idea is that you're going to establish medical necessity that what you're doing is actually uh, making life better, again, for the patient, but also for, as we've said several times, the body part. That's not my terms. That's actually the CMS term for establishing medical necessity. You may want to also consider uh, to discuss uh, the improvement of com compliance. How are they doing with understanding the physician or the physical therapist? Are they following through with what they're supposed to? And what kind of response? If you can, provide numerical information. Uh, it may be of some value to put some uh, data regarding their interpretation, how things are going, and for that matter, your own observations. And a continued statement on What's a frequency and duration of service? I'm going to see the patient tomorrow. Uh, this should last another month, or whatever the case is. You may want to consider putting bullets or providing some, uh, if, you, if you can imagine this, uh, some cue that will let you address each of these questions. It could be the, that the form actually follows the pattern that we're sharing with you on this particular screen. How about slide 17, please? <clears throat> 
What kind of diagnosis should I expect? I mentioned to you several times that DSM is not the primary diagnosis here. We're looking for an ICD-10. Uh, and you can look up that information in a variety of sources, and we'll we'll share some with you, including icd10data.com, which has all this data and many, many more. Uh, here's some often used diagnosis for uh, the kinds of uh, interventions and assessments that we're considering. Essential hypertension, diabetes, chronic pain, overweight, and obesity, and of course, uh, on council, we had a very interesting discussion on the difference between overweight and obesity, uh, and we will just default at the present time to the terms used by the uh, uh, CDC uh, at this juncture. But these are often used diagnosis as well as, of course, the disorders of muscle. These are not exclusively the ones that will be reimbursed. First, as I share with you, there could be 60,000 other diagnoses that you could use, but it's important to note that the HMB codes often have a formulary of codes, that is diagnostic codes, that would be allowed with each of these specific activities. So just because they exist in ICD doesn't mean they will be reimbursed. But here are some examples or are some examples of the codes that are typically reimbursed with the health and behavior codes. Let's go on to slide number 18, please. All right, so we have a couple of slides with case examples. The first two are pretty straightforward. The last one is a bit more complicated. Let's tackle these. First one is a five-year-old that has a, if you will, juvenile di a diabetes type one, and there's questions about the family's ability to manage the complicated uh, treatment uh, regimen. So in this case, you want to work with the child, you want to work with the family, maybe alone, maybe together, and develop a plan of action. Another one is a 57-year-old man that is a bit more complicated with solid organ transplantation, and we're trying to design a procedure that helps the patient adhere to the demands not only of the surgery, but after the surgery as well. What are the things that they should expect? What, uh, what happens when they get discharged, any follow-up, and so forth, so on. As you know, the proof is in the pudding, so our goal is to be able to outline in workable, understandable fashion to the patient what are the demands and, for that matter, what are the solutions that we might want to pursue in making sure that the transplant is a successful one. The next slide provides a more detailed and more complicated case of a young person with insulin-independent di uh, diabetes. We have uh, difficulties with uh, insulin injections and glucose monitoring. Uh, many, off, many times the patient says that uh, it hurts, they're afraid of needles, uh, they're not sure what to do, uh, they haven't been, the parents haven't been able to have a, their own life, but they also feel that they're not being successful in dealing with the complicated uh, situation, both of the diabetes and the child's ability to understand and follow directions. Uh, all these things are starting to have significant emotional uh, situations, as well as relying on uh, a complicated system that's not being adhered to successfully. So, even though this uh, is the actual case that's presented in the CPT Changes and Insider's View, which is published by AMA every year with the significant changes in the CPT system, it is also an important one in that it describes both a physical problem as well as an emotional problem. Despite the fact that uh, it doesn't make sense for us to think about a Cartesian dualism where we have physical and mental as separate entities. In this case, we do. So I want to emphasize using this case example that you could use H and B codes to deal with, for example, the diabetes, and you might use the psychotherapy codes to deal with the depression, the family complications that go with the emotionality of not being able to successfully deal with such a complicated case. Uh, and a word of advice here. Uh, so if you're providing your diagnosis, when you do an HMB code, you may want to consider or you should do the ICD code as the primary diagnosis. 
uh, realizing that you should not be the first one to diagnose diabetes because you're not licensed to do so. Uh, your primary care provider or the specialist has already done that. So you're borrowing that diagnosis and moving forward with the primary diagnosis being diabetes. But if there's an adjustment problem or a depression problem, uh, you should consider doing that as a second diagnosis. And in doing so, you set yourself up to open for the future of treatment for the depression. And in that case, when you're doing psychotherapy for the depression of this child, then what you might want to do is, or you should do, is put your depression diagnosis as the primary diagnosis and diabetes as your secondary diagnosis. And that way you can flip and flop depending on whether you're doing a physical intervention or a mental health intervention. Disappointingly, again, we're dealing with the Cartesian dualism. And I know, we all know, that never do we just do one or the other. But the goal is of an event. What did you do at least 51% of the time? Next slide, please. Now comes your turn. How about what, what questions or comments do you have? We have about 15, 20 minutes. Let's tackle your concerns. And what we'll, what we're going to do for starters is how about if we begin by sharing some of the questions that uh, you folks have sent us ahead of time, which we greatly appreciate. And then we'll answer as many questions as we can with uh, the time allocated. So, uh, Nicole, could we tackle some of those questions? Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Puente, for all that information. We're going to go ahead and cover the first four questions on the slide that were submitted earlier. And then I'm going to go ahead and intersperse a few that we're getting as the webinar has gone on. Thank you. So can a psychologist use these codes even if the patient has not seen the doctor or the doctor has not made the referral? Yes. However, it's important that you not be the first one to make the physical health diagnosis. So if you're working for a diet with the diabetes and so forth, make sure that someone in the record has already made that diagnosis. And it may be valuable that you get the actual records that describe or have that in the diagnosis. But no, uh, you don't necessarily uh, need a referral for uh, this kind of uh, intervention or assessment. Can I bill on the same day that the medical provides, uh, provider sees a patient? I think this question actually comes from uh, a practitioner that has historically had some challenges when working in the mental health world. In the mental health world, we often share the patient with a social worker or a psychiatrist. And in those situations, we have some really difficult problems because if the psychiatrist has seen him for a psychiatric evaluation that day, for example, an interview, you may not be, according to the carrier, uh, be allowed to provide that assessment either. But if a primary care provider takes a look at the patient and, he, and evaluates the patient using an E&M code and then refers the patient, all the better. And as a matter of fact, imagine these codes are intended to have psychological and medical practitioners work side by side or embedded in each other's services. This is, if you will, the overall concept of integrated uh, healthcare. Can I use psychotherapy codes along with the HMB codes? Yes. I, and maybe even in the same day. It makes no sense uh, to me, being a practitioner like you, to try and say, okay, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to work on uh, compliance to diabetic medication or smoking cessation. And then for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to do psychotherapy. I, I realize it doesn't make sense, but this is how the system is set up. Uh, so you can do it. Now, having said that, again, double check the LCD to make sure that you can do this. Is there a problem with providing neuropsychological assessment and HMB assessment or intervention activities? No. As a matter of fact, one could argue that neuropsychological assessment could be a foundation for eventual HMB work, or alternatively, a quick screen on the floor uh, using an HMB assessment uh, 
might then be the foundation for you to go out and do neuropsychological assessment. Uh, these codes are particularly robust for neuropsychologists and health psychologists because they work uh, more with ICD diagnoses than DSM, but it's certainly not limited to them alone. Nicole, do we have any other questions uh, that we can look at or have uh, any come in yeah. that we can take a look at as well? Yes, before we go into the next slide, we've had um, a couple people ask whether these, these codes are setting or facility specific. Do you have to use them in a hospital or can they be used anywhere? One thing that has changed in the last few years is that the setting is not as important as it has been. So uh, these codes are not setting specific. So you could use them, for example, in outpatient situations like an individual uh, practice setting, a group practice setting, in a clinic, in a hospital, inpatient or outpatient, nursing home. It doesn't matter, even the patient's own home. So these are not setting specific. And could you provide some more detail um, if you were to use uh, a mental health diagnosis and you were to use an H and B code um, throughout the same session, how would you handle that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's not inappropriate to use a mental health diagnosis uh, with an H and B code, but, and this is the big but, not as a primary diagnosis. So if you use a, a mental health diagnosis like depression, and you're using it to do intervention, and that's a primary code, you will be rejected. Uh, as a consequence, you must always have as a primary and maybe secondary or tertiary diagnosis, uh, a physical diagnosis. So you could, for example, have as a primary diagnosis, multiple sclerosis. And then as a secondary diagnosis, oh, for example, diabetes. And it's a third diagnosis, oh, I don't know, Parkinson's. And then it's a fourth diagnosis, be depression. Depression may be critical to understanding the healthcare needs of that patient, but since you're dealing with a physical intervention or assessment, you are basically using the ICD diagnosis as the original ones. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide of questions that were submitted earlier. Our HMB codes are proven reimbursable under uh, Medicare and, for that matter, Medicaid. Well, sad to say that most states, as far as I could tell, do not uh, basically capture reimbursement for Medicaid. Uh, you can do them, but you won't get reimbursed for them. Medicare, the answer is yes. Now, the reimbursement might vary slightly but uh, they are. Now, how about a different question? It's not on here, but let's ask it. Uh, what about uh, Medicare Advantage? Or what about Blue Cross Blue Shield? Or what about TRICARE? Well, it all depends on the plan, on the insurance company, and maybe even on the specific patient that you're working with. So as always, make sure ahead of time that you clear it. And for some reason, it's not carried by your state or by your carrier, uh, that is the carrier of the patient that you're working with, advocate. Advocate through APA, advocate through your state association, or through your specialty group. It's our goal to make sure that all patients who have these kind of problems are being attended to successfully. What about our HMB codes reimbursed at lower rates than traditional codes? I'm not sure what they mean by traditional codes, but I am going to make an assumption that traditional codes are interpreted to mean the so-called psychotherapy codes. So in this case, the HMB codes are reimbursed generally, not always, but generally less than psychotherapy or for that matter, any type of other uh, codes involving uh, the traditional mental health. For example, uh, psychiatric interviewing, which is heavily reimbursed and for that matter, uh, neuropsych or psych testing. But we are putting this on the table. The practice director is very concerned about the value and importance of these codes and the poor reimbursement as well as the lack of non-face-to-face -face reimbursement. Uh, so hang in there. Give us a little bit of time. Maybe this year, if not next year, we'll attend to 
the reimbursement levels, which I think, in my opinion, are too low. If HMB codes get reimbursed at a lower rate than mental health psychotherapy codes, let me just go ahead and use the 90834 or, for that matter, 37. I, I'll get reimbursed better than that, right, Tony? Well, you don't necessarily want to do that. That's basically coding by economics. Coding by reimbursement actually is a is uh, is illegal. It's probably unethical. It will get you into a hot water. You most likely will be audited. And if you don't, uh, or if you're not fortunate enough to have to just simply pay back that, uh, you will probably uh, be fined and and possibly even jail. So. No, do not code by reimbursement. Code by activity. How about some more questions? Okay, we've had a couple very specific questions regarding reimbursement in some other slides that we've already presented. So the first is, I would just like to verify that 96150 assessment can be billed for one unit if face-to-face -face time is arranged from 7.5 minutes to 15 minutes. Are insurers generally aware of this, such that if documentation shows 10 minutes of face-to-face, -face, they will indeed pay for one unit, even though it's not 15 minutes? Yes. In fact, uh, let me say a few things about that very, very astute question. First of all, you really want to go to 7 minutes and 31 seconds, not 7 minutes and 30 seconds, because that's the stopping point. Uh, now, I also hope that none of us are walking around with a stopwatch, say it's 7:31. Uh, it's time to bill. Uh, and so I, I think what you should think about is the following: If I get a group of records audited, because that's usually how it works. They don't audit one; they audit several. So I get maybe 10 records from January 2nd of uh, 2018. If that happens, what's the average amount of time? If the average amount of time for these codes happens to be eight minutes, I think you may be in trouble. The assumption is that sometimes it's eight minutes, sometimes it's 12, others nine, others are 11. But if we put them all together, they're going to be roughly, on average, 15 minutes. If all these combined, I have an average, that average should be 15 minutes. So uh, I realize that sometimes you're lucky to get seven and a half plus minutes in a situation. The patient is in bad shape. It's a very intense, complicated, fast moving environment. Uh, but hopefully that's only once in a while. The overall should be roughly 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 and so forth. Good question. Thank you. Two more that have come in. Um, how can we be reimbursed for the time used to write assessment reports and or communicate with other providers about these patients? Unlike the traditional diagnostic and testing codes involving uh, mental health, such as for uh, psychiatric interviewing and psychological testing, these only reimburse for face-to-face -face time. So you may want to do the report uh, uh, if you can with a patient present as you're gathering data. However, that at the present time is not allocated for. Okay, and then is an assessment required for each patient in a group format prior to the patient starting the group? I think that's a great question and one that actually I have never really thought about uh, specifically, but let's imagine this scenario. How about if you have a whole bunch of patients in a VA setting that have been referred for a, a chronic pain group. Uh, let's assume, let's assume that these patients have already been evaluated and there's some indication that this kind of intervention could work. I think if there's a fundamental uh, basis to explain why is it that you haven't done any evaluation, I think you're in good shape. Probably not a bad idea. I don't think it's required, uh, but uh, establish a foundation of why the intervention has to occur or should occur based on the referral uh, source or the, the reason for the intervention. These are great questions and look forward to hearing more from you. But unfortunately, our time is starting to wrap up. So 
Nicole, how about if I turn it over to you so you can provide some commentary as we finish up in our today's uh, webinar? Uh, thank you, Dr. Puente. I'm actually going to let you ha tackle three more questions uh, that we previously had because very similar ones keep coming in. So let's okay. go ahead and take these last three. All right. So I apologize for making this a little longer than before, but these are good questions. How do I bill for services provided to parents of very young children? who can't participate, but are present. As I've said, shared with you, as long as the patient is present, but don't necessarily participate, you're, you're good to go. Now you may want to explain, why is it that they're not able to participate? Uh, they could be that they're autistic and they're dealing with some head banging and your goal is to help somehow the other uh, ameliorate the problem associated with a physical health diagnosis. Well, explain that. Working with parents of a patient who just died, the body's present, but the patient is definitely not. Well, uh, terrible circumstance. I'm sad to report that at the present time, the patient must be face to face. And just because they're in front of you, if you will, or they could be in front of you, they have to be able to participate, as I mentioned earlier in one of the slides. There has to be some form of communication and a deceased patient does not qualify for the use of HMB codes. And finally, can psychologists code physical exercises under health and behavior codes as an add-on to therapy clients recommended treatment? I don't think you should think about HMB codes as an add-on, although if you want to, for example, do this in addition to psychotherapy, by all means. But in terms of uh, physical exercises, I'm assuming that you mean uh, helping them understand how to do physical therapy and things of that nature. If that's the case, also good to go. These are great questions. I wish we had more time to answer them. And uh, hopefully uh, you consider these H and B codes as a way to move forward to expand the practice of psychology outside of traditional mental health settings uh, and mental health diagnoses. These are very robust. Uh, there's still work to be done and look forward to making the new codes uh, better than they currently are. Until then, here's some resources you can take a look at. The Practice Central uh, is always full of information and my own psychologycoding.org has some templates that you might use for documentations as well as an ICD diagnosis uh, webinar that you might take a look at. Uh, and a couple of next slides and I'll turn it over to you, Nicole, to wrap it up. Thank you, Dr. Puentes. We really appreciated all that information. Um, for those of you who have been enjoying our monthly webinars, be sure to check out Progress Notes. It's a podcast produced by the APA Practice Organization with practicing psychologists in mind. And there's the link at the bottom. Um, if you are having problems with insurance companies reimbursing you for your services, please contact the APA Practice Organization for help. Their legal and regulatory affairs team monitor billing issues. When appropriate, they've taken action against managed care and insurance company abuses. And then we just want to thank you all for being here today. Um, as I said at the beginning, a link to today's recorded webinar will be emailed to all registrants within the next four to six hours or possibly 24 to 48. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've had a lot of snow in our area and uh, it's going to take us a little bit of time to catch up, but you will get these. They're also available on the APA Practice Organization website um, within the next couple weeks. We'd like your feedback on this webinar. Um, with each recording email, there's a link to a survey. We would appreciate it if you would take time to fill this out. And we just want to say thank you and have a great day. Thank you all. Look forward to uh, seeing and working with you. Bye-bye.